Hi folks, welcome back. And welcome back is right. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Uh, to say I have not been healthy the last month would be a vast understatement. But I seem to be going in the right direction. So I'm going to give it a go and try to do another one of these. So let's try it and see what happens, shall we? Now in this video, I'm going to continue discussing uh, polymorphisms and how the evolutionists deceive us into thinking that they act in an evolutionary manner. And in the last video, I explained the truth behind how the evolutionists deceived us with the story of the peppered moth. And I'm going to begin this video with another example. And this example is representative of what the evolutionists do all the time in countless ways. So, one day, I was watching a nature show on a popular TV channel, something that I enjoy doing, and I like watching shows like this until they inevitably ruin it by talking about evolution. And this show was about a family of biologists who travel around the globe investigating the natural world and various forms of animal life. Now in this episode, they were investigating a species of lizards. And best I can recall, I believe they were skinks in another part of the world, which I believe was Indonesia. So lizards like this guy here, the Indonesian blue tongue skink. But to be clear, the location, the type of lizard, all that, it's actually irrelevant here. What's relevant is, as I said, this is an example of what the evolutionists do all the time and how they do it. So they were visiting the islands in this area and comparing the varying color patterns of the lizards that they found on the different islands to each other and to the mainland which were all the same species. And now with a lizard in hand and showing how the color pattern of the lizards on that island was different from those of the other islands and different still from the mainland that they visited, one of the, bi uh, one of the biologists uh, exclaims, it's amazing to watch the process of evolution as it's happening. Now, when I heard that, what I thought was, no, what's actually amazing is that an entire family of university trained and educated biologists don't have a clue what they're talking about. What's amazing is that university trained and educated biologists are ignorant of their own subject matter and don't understand genetics. Once again, folks, it's all rhetoric, deception, and lies. It's all the, the agenda the evolutionists are pushing. But as I watched that, I also thought the overwhelming majority of people who watch such a TV show will believe what they say because what they're saying seems to make sense. But as I already explained, it actually makes no sense whatsoever. Situations like these lizards and the countless others that the evolutionists spin to make it sound like evolution are not evolution. This is another example of naturally occurring allele frequencies within a population due to polymorphisms. As I already explained in the previous video, when a population is isolated from others of the same species, it limits the number of alleles available. This results in what most people would call inbreeding, and those alleles will dominate in the population. And let me show you how this works using our crayon genes again. Okay, so here we have our box of crayons again, and we used this before as the crayon genes. And if you look in the box, you see we got a bunch of crayons in here. And they're all the same like they're the same gene, they're a crayon. They're used to color pretty pictures, right? 
They're all made the same. They've got um, wax, colored wax, etc. But they don't all look the same, do they? That represents the different alleles. So they're the same gene, yet they're not all exactly the same. And take a bunch of these out here. Let's talk about the situation with these lizards. So if this is our mainland. We've got a bunch of them on the mainland. And then we've got some that get on the various islands around there. And they get over there on boats or by thumbing down a whale that's going their way. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> so let's say we've got all these other islands around here and we've got various lizards on those islands. But you see, compared to, put all these here, compared to the mainland where we've got a bunch of them, we've got a bunch of different alleles represented by all these different colored crayons here that let's say this is the mainland, right? We got a bunch of them. But on these islands, we have limited numbers of alleles represented on those islands. So when these guys mate and reproduce, they've only got in this case three alleles, a limited set of alleles. Here, an even smaller number set of alleles is the same thing here. And then here again, we have three alleles represented. So if you look, just by looking at the colors represented by our crayons, if you go to this island, you're going to see the if these, um, as the uh, people on the show were looking at, if these represent colors of the scales, right, color patterns of the scales, this one, you see these, the, the lizards from this island are going to look different than they are from this one, from this one, and from this one, and different still from the ones on the mainland. So folks, this is not evolution. This is expected because we have a limited number of alleles in each of these islands versus a larger number of alleles um, from the mainland. So as you go around collecting from these different places, you expect to see that they would look different because there is a limited number of alleles represented on each. And this is just like I said in a previous video. This is the same reason why Norwegians primarily have white skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, right? Africans mainly have black skin. Asians primarily have black hair. Because in those segregated populations, the same alleles keep getting mixed and you see the same phenotypes displayed. So as you visit the other isolated populations of the same species, like the lizards on the other islands, for example, you expect them to look different from one another. You expect them to look different from one another because each isolated population is a representation of the limited number of alleles that were restricted to that population. You um, Just like you only have a limited number of, of the crayons that I was using in my example. And it has nothing to do with evolution. It's not evolution. It is the... Um, the uh, currents of the allele frequencies that create this situation. It is not evolution. And to consider that this is evolution is not only clueless and ignorant, it's also, um, it's also just like saying that Shaquille O'Neal, Michael J. Fox, and Ichiro Suzuki represent different species because they're so different in appearance. And now, I don't know about you, but I just love Shaq. He's hilarious. 
I love his commercials, and he just seems like a genuinely nice guy. So, Shaq, if you're out there watching, I love you, man, and I would love to meet you one day. This deceptive approach that the evolutionists take with allele frequencies and polymorphisms is not only ignorant and clueless, it also makes me angry. It's just another example of fraud. You cannot take college courses in biology and genetics without learning these principles. However, this is what gets taught as evolution in schools, colleges, and universities across our country and our world, even though the science of genetics says otherwise. Case in point, I reviewed what Wikipedia had to say about the story of the peppered moth, which I explained the fallacy of in the last video. In that entry, I found this statement. Evolution is defined as a change in the frequency of an allele within a gene pool. No, it's not. This is another fraudulent claim. You can change the color, curliness, or coarseness of human hair all you want, but it's still human hair, and those people will still remain humans. You can change the coloring of lizards all you want, but it still has scales, and it's still the same lizard. You can change the size of the wings of a northern fruit fly all you want, but it still has wings, and it's still a northern fruit fly. So, let me explain that one to you. In the January 24, 2000, biology section of the U.S. News & World Report, Tim Appenzeller asserted that Darwin keeps winning hands down when it comes to the theory of evolution by citing an example of northern fruit flies that adapted to their environment by growing larger wings. However, Mr. Appenzeller is just another example of someone who just doesn't get it. Once again, such a claim certainly sounds good to those who don't understand genetics, but this is just another example of allele frequencies within the northern fruit fly population. What was observed here in this situation was yet another case of phenotypic variation as a result of allele frequencies. The alleles for the larger wings were already present in the population. And, similar to the peppered moss, when the situation and the right breeding combination enabled those alleles to dominate, they became the dominant phenotype. But here's the thing. No new genetic information was gained here and no new species was created here. The larger wings on northern fruit flies do not make them a new species. They're still northern fruit flies, and they always will be. They just have bigger wings. Just like Shaquille O'Neal, Michael J. Fox, and Ichiro Suzuki, all have much different frames and much different skin tones. The fact remains, green beans have never evolved into peas, and cats have never evolved into dogs, and apes have never evolved into humans. But the ways that the evolutionists fuel their agenda and propaganda machine by misappropriating such terms and concepts and creating confusion over the topics of genetics and heritability do not end here. But I guess it's easy to create confusion over the genetics and of heritability when you yourself are confused on the topic. For example, the Darwinian theory of natural selection attempts to explain the origin of new species via phenotypic variations that developed into new genes that accumulated gradually but consistently enough over time to create a new species. Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species, Natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world the slightest variations 
rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good. But changing alleles does not create the new genetic information required to create new forms, if you believe in the fallacy of evolution. A change in the frequency of an, of an allele within a gene pool has nothing to do with evolution. It's the genetics of heritability and mutations that must account for evolution. But the evolutionists have fraudulently, fraudulently changed this also to fit their agenda and fuel their propaganda machine. And I think this is going to be a good point to end this video. But come on back for the next one, which hopefully won't be a month from now, where I still have more to say about this topic. And if you like what you hear, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, we'll leave the light on for you.